Let's travel back in time to Brooklyn of the mid-1890s. Imagine walking up the steps of the Eckford Club, a fashionable social organization frequented by men. Your host leads you into an elegant parlor where he directs your attention to a large glass paned wooden case. It's filled with well over 150 baseballs, each gilded in gold leaf, painstakingly decorated with the particulars of the game in which it was used. One ball in particular is pointed out. It's dated September 18th, 1862, and it comes from the Eckford Club victory over the rival Atlantic Baseball Club of Brooklyn to win the national championship that year. The national championship. Our club hasn't had a baseball nine in over 20 years, your host says. Nowadays, baseball is played by teams of hired professionals. But back in the amateur era, it was played by young men who represented clubs just like ours for the love of the game and the pride they took in competing for the Eckford Club. Conversations along these lines used to take place whenever visitors toured the Eckford Social Club. But with each passing year, the idea that the members of a gentleman's social club once had captured the national championship became more astonishing to those who heard the story for the first time. Founded in the summer of 1855, the Eckford Club initially established its grounds at the Manor House, a palatial country estate in the North Brooklyn neighborhood of Greenpoint that had been converted into a public inn a couple of decades earlier. Surrounded by cherry trees, the picturesque site soon became a favorite of Brooklyn sportsmen who relished escaping from the hustle and bustle of the city to fish for striped bass in Newtown Creek or hunt in the adjoining woods. When the Eckford Club selected the Manor House as their headquarters, a new wing was added for the exclusive use of club members. An account written by Frank Pigeon, the club's first president and the pitcher on his baseball nine, suggests that in the early days of the Eckford Club, its ball playing outings primarily served as refreshing excursions into the countryside for a few hours of invigorating exercise in the fresh air. As he recalled, we would forget business and everything else on Tuesday afternoons, go out in the green fields, don our ball suits, and go at it with a perfect rush. At such times, we were boys again. Such sport as this brightens a man up and improves him both in mind and body. It was more than a year before Pigeon and his comrades eventually plucked up the courage to arrange a match against outside competition. When the big day arrived, he recorded nine determined but badly scared men made their way to the site of the game while whistling to keep up their spirits. Many of their friends were no-shows because as Pigeon recalled, they did not wish to witness our defeat. And indeed, the first two Ackford batters were retired with ease. The third batter, however, gave the ball a regular crusher, causing a desperate yell to burst from eight throats. And when he subsequently scored, Pigeon recalled how proud the Eckford club were of that run. Some ran to the umpire's book to see how it looked on paper. And when the Eckfords went on to an unexpected victory, about seven o'clock that evening, Pigeon recounted, nine peacocks might have been seen on their way home with tail feathers spread. On your tour of the Eckford club parlor, your host would have undoubtedly pointed out the baseball from the club's very first game, bearing the inscription won by the Eckford Club, September 17th, 1856, score 22 to eight. Don't give up the ship. It's a charming memory and one that neatly sums up why many of the men who played baseball during the years between about 1855 and 1867 came to regard that era as a golden age. But were those years truly a golden age, or do such comments reflect the distorting tendency of nostalgia? Let's take a closer look. One defining characteristic of the United States prior to the mid-19th century 
was that none of its cities had yet approached the size of European cities like London, Paris, and Naples. Instead, Americans were described as still villagers at heart, with church spires, the tallest buildings in most cities. But the Industrial Revolution wrought rapid change, and as Americans moved from farms and small towns to the vertical skyscrapers of their increasingly bustling cities, they felt an acute longing for the sense of community that they'd left behind. To address that deficiency, they founded such a wide variety of fraternal organizations, benevolent societies, and relief associations that it became common to refer to the United States as a nation of joiners. When French diplomat Alexis de Tocqueville visited in 1831 to study American prisons, he became fascinated with the democratic spirit behind the national craving for public associations in civic life. In the classic study that resulted, de Tocqueville marveled that Americans use associations to give fetes, to found seminaries, to build inns, to raise churches. In this manner, they create hospitals, prisons, schools. Clubs became popular in the United States for similar reasons, and from the start, they were very different from their counterparts in England. Whereas British clubs were typically restricted to those of high birth or social standing, American clubs brought together those with a specific bond, such as a shared interest, occupation, or activity. The first baseball clubs were of this type, as their very names indicated. Since the Eckford Club hailed from Brooklyn, the modern custom would be to refer to its ball-playing contingent as the Brooklyn Eckfords. But during the amateur era, the name was instead the Eckford Baseball Club of Brooklyn, a nomenclature that drew attention to its status as a club. This naming convention was pervasive during this era, with Baseball Club, or BBC, being used in newspaper accounts, club rules or correspondence, and paraphernalia. Indeed, the Eckford Club flag of the day includes the BBC abbreviation, and yes, throughout much of the 19th century, the game was spelled as two words, not one, base ball. It was not a coincidence that the word team only entered the baseball lexicon in 1868, just as the period that many of these men thought of as a golden age drew to a close. The selection of a club name also reflected the pride taken by the members in the traits they shared. Many clubs, for example, took names that proclaimed their civic or national pride. With volunteerism said to be a test of a young man's good citizenship, there was a close link between volunteer firefighting companies and baseball clubs. One of the greatest New York City clubs of the era was the Mutual Baseball Club, which was formed by members of the Mutual Hook and Ladder Company No. 1. A baseball from a game between the Mutual Club and the Eckford Club reveals that the game took place on Independence Day of 1871, and that underdog club from Brooklyn defeated the New Yorkers by the astonishing score of 7-0, shutouts being quite a rarity during the era. Workplace bonds also yielded many clubs. Another New York club was formed by medical students and doctors who called themselves the Esculapians in a nod to Asclepius, the Greek god of medicine. The Eckford Club itself was composed of expert shipbuilders and other artisans who worked at the New York shipyards and was named in honor of Henry Eckford, a legendary shipbuilder. Frank Pigeon was a shipbuilder, and so was his closest boyhood friend George Steers, who had gained fame a few years earlier for designing the yacht America. In 1851, the America had handily defeated 14 rivals in an international competition that became known as the America's Cup in honor of the triumphant yacht. The ball players among the shipbuilders were by no means ready for major competition. Indeed, with New York shipyards a whirlwind of activity in the mid 1850s, the members of the Eckford Baseball Club were kept so busy that they could practice only once a week, rather than the customary three of most of their rival clubs. 
But which side scored the most runs was still of little moment, with the result that the rules, the layout of the playing field, and even the number of players were often adaptable. What mattered to them was the deep camaraderie and sense of belonging that resulted. This pride led club members to view themselves as ambassadors for their organizations and their community, and to regard their uniforms as a very important symbol of membership. Considerable effort was put into the choice of colors and design, and it was nothing less than a disgrace to appear for a match game without a clean uniform. Many baseball clubs of the 1850s and 1860s also had their own logos, ribbons, songs, and other emblems of membership. No pre-Civil War club did more to advance the game than the Knickerbocker Club of New York City. Yet the Knickerbockers experienced very little success on the playing field. Their significance instead comes from their historic decision to write down their rules in 1845. And even that contribution is easily misunderstood because it conditions us to expect rules that are magisterial in their scope. Instead, when we take a close look at the 20 rules, yes, just 20, we find bizarre directives like, no stump match shall be played on a regular day of exercise, and administrative orders such as, members must strictly observe the time agreed upon for exercise and be punctual in their attendance. Hardly any of these rules were original even in 1845, and such crucial issues as the number of players per side and how to determine which side won were not addressed at all. What the Knickerbocker Club had written down was really just a list of the modifications they'd made to a familiar game that many Americans had played during childhood. Still, it raises the question of why their rules are important. The answer is that they wrote them down. This is what's so important about the Knickerbocker's contribution to the game. At first, it didn't look that way. Over the next decade, onlookers were more inclined to mock them for playing a child's game than to inquire about their rules. And the Knickerbockers themselves seemed often on the verge of abandoning baseball. But writing down the rules proved very fortuitous when the way Americans learn new information was revolutionized. Newspaper circulation almost doubled nationwide between 1850 and 1860. Most Americans had always depended upon word of mouth for their information. Even the most important news often took weeks or months to reach isolated regions, if it arrived at all. But by the mid-1850s, more and more Americans were expecting and demanding a newspaper filled with the latest happenings in faraway places. The printed word itself began to be seen as an exciting new medium. Newspaper editors soon found it so hard to find enough content to satisfy those expectations that they began hiring an employee known as the Scissors, who was prized for speed, judgment, and accuracy in getting the news out of other papers into his own. Newspapers that catered to the sporting crowd, such as the New York Clipper and Porter's Spirit of the Times, were no different. In this environment, the 1855 publication of the Knickerbocker Rules in the sporting press and New York newspapers found a receptive audience. In contrast to the oral tradition previously used to transmit the rules, it was now necessary for one player to read the rules and for the rest of us to play the game according to the book. Fittingly, Detroit's first baseball club was formed when printers for the local newspapers read a description of the new version in an eastern sporting periodical called the New York Clipper. The printers then organized the Franklin Club, a name that paid tribute to Benjamin Franklin, a printer by trade. The excitement over this new ability to transmit the written word to faraway places was such that, in effect, the rules used by a baseball club in New York were being carried over every railway and set down at every station. Until this time, each region had played its own distinctive bat and ball game. Most New Englanders enjoyed a game called round ball or the Massachusetts game, 
Pennsylvanians and residents of several other states opted for town ball. Virginians played round town. Connecticut residents preferred a cricket hybrid called wicket. And several other bat and ball games flourished in isolated pockets of the country. Under these circumstances, it would have taken decades to create a standard version by means of oral transmission, even in the unlikely event that every region agreed to give up its familiar rules. Yet, with the help of the telegraph and the railroad, the power of the printed word was such that, within five years, the New York rules replaced most of the other versions. And in less than a decade, it stood alone. The triumph of the Knickerbocker rules was also directly responsible for that club taking a leadership role in providing a greater degree of organization. Its members called the 1857 meeting that brought into being the sport's first governing body, the National Association of Baseball Players, which annually published its constitution, bylaws, and rules and regulations of the game of baseball. The sudden rush of new clubs in the aftermath of the publication of the rules created the need for greater uniformity in those rules. A committee of Knickerbocker club members again took the lead, introducing much needed standards and clarifications, such as the nine inning game and the 90 foot distance between the bases, while still retaining flexibility wherever practical. Although it's sometimes said that the Civil War was responsible for the spread of baseball to the four corners of the United States, the evidence points to the more remarkable conclusion that the game's success between 1855 and 1867 was achieved in spite of the war. Dramatic growth took place in the years before the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter in 1861, an actual historical event in which Abner Doubleday the mythical inventor of baseball really did take part. But most clubs founded during these years disbanded at the start of the war. And while there are some documented instances of soldiers playing baseball, these were by no means common. One such game took place among Union prisoners at Salisbury Confederate Prison in Salisbury, North Carolina, a rare color lithograph from 1863 recording the event. If the Civil War didn't kindle enthusiasm, then what did? Well, baseball was very much a young man's game during these years. For participants, the sense of belonging that came from club membership and the rapid diffusion of the written rules remained important factors. The two additional ones assumed an increasingly prominent role. The game's inherent flexibility and the natural rivalries that emerged. Flexibility is the essence of any children's game. The enduring popularity of tag and hide and go seek and similar games reflects their adaptability to an ever-changing number of players and almost any location. Even after men began to play baseball, Americans continued to take advantage of this adaptability. During the pre-war years, cricket had vied with baseball for supremacy in a few eastern cities. But that sport's well-established rules and customs left it unsuitable to frontier surroundings. By contrast, baseball could be played with improvised equipment on almost any site that had even a modest amount of flat ground. For example, a club formed in Baraboo, Wisconsin in 1866 used homemade bats that were turned out at the local mills. This allowed each player to have his own favorite bat made according to his own specifications. They all varied considerably in length, diameter, heft, and material. This club also used a number of different playing fields according to availability, including one that was covered with a luxuriant growth of June grass which was always cropped short by the large herd of town cows, which at the time enjoyed free range. The club can also lay claim to another distinction, the earliest extant baseball uniform, an outfit worn by club member Legrand Lippet, dating to around 1866.
Baseball's other significant post-war boost came from the natural rivalries that developed between clubs representing nearby towns. Land travel was still plagued by so many formidable obstacles in the mid-19th century. Many rural Americans rarely, if ever, journeyed more than 10 or 15 miles from their homes. This gave the prospect of a visit to or from a neighboring community considerable excitement. That was heightened by the competition between towns to serve as a stop on the railroad lines being cut through the country. The pull on civic pride was such that a newspaper in Nagani in Michigan's Upper Peninsula proclaimed that no place can lay claim to any importance until it has its baseball club. The membership of these baseball clubs grew so rapidly as to far exceed the nine players who could take the field. But for the young men who kept clamoring to join, that wasn't the point. The Niagara's of Buffalo was said to be really a men's social club with 60 or 70 members. The nine were merely the athletic features. Many such clubs formed second nines, third nines, and so on, all the way down to so-called muffin nines the noun eventually leading to the creation of the verb to muff, as in to muff a fly ball. Belonging to a club was a privilege, not a right, however. Members had to be elected, and anyone who did not fulfill their duties was liable to be expelled. Foremost among their responsibilities was paying club dues in a timely manner. Indeed, the surest sign that this was baseball's amateur era was that the players paid for the right to play the game. In 1863, for example, it cost $3 for a year-long membership to the Mercantile Baseball Club of Philadelphia. A high level of conduct and regular attendance were also required with fines issued to offenders. Many clubs underscored the privilege of membership by inviting local dignitaries to become honorary members. The Custer Club of Ionia, Michigan, for example, was named in honor of George Custer, who spent much of his boyhood in Michigan, and it counted Custer among a long list of honorary members that also included five local clergymen. Still, the issue of social class was particularly tricky. In theory, there was nothing to stop any white man from taking part. But since all play had to take place during daylight hours, and Sunday games were deemed sacrilegious, a working man would have to forego much of the day's pay in order to represent his club. Furthermore, while some African American ball clubs of the era were able to compete against their white counterparts, others could not gain entry. Most notoriously, the Pythian Baseball Club of Philadelphia was unsuccessful in an 1867 bid for membership in the National Association of Baseball Players. For that matter, women were encouraged to be supporters of baseball clubs, but they found themselves unwelcome if they attempted to assume any other role. The treatment of both of those groups will be explored in greater detail in some of our other classes. The National Association of Baseball Players banned professional play in 1859. This statute would be largely a moot point until enclosed ballparks were used on a regular basis. Nevertheless, the prohibition had considerable symbolic significance as an affirmation that baseball clubs would continue to be member-sustained amateur clubs. But the game's new governing body also took charge of the rules and began to review and modify them each off-season. As the game moved inevitably toward professionalism, the most beloved features of baseball's amateur era were jeopardized or shunted to the side. Under the table payments became rampant. One manifestation was the creation of East Coast powerhouses. A Midwestern journalist explained to his confused readers that these clubs were made up not only of gentlemen who are members from the love of exercise and sport, but in a large degree of professional baseball players who do but little save practice their favorite game. 
Even more damage was done by so-called revolvers. These were hired gun ball players who jumped from club to club, ruining the much anticipated rivalries between neighboring towns. The revolvers prompted bitter criticisms of the very costly and very unsatisfactory system of paying nine players to travel about the country and represent the real club, which was all the time at home, and of the silliness of believing that the fate of cities rested in the hands of a few hired ball players. After the 1868 season, the National Association of Baseball Players was forced to admit that its prohibition on professional play was a dead letter and repealed it, officially bringing the game's amateur era to an end. That's when former ball player Pete O'Brien of the Atlantic Club of Brooklyn wrote with deep sadness, somehow or other, they don't play ball nowadays as they used to some eight or 10 years ago. I don't mean to say they don't play it as well, but I mean that they don't play with the same kind of feelings or for the same objects they used to. O'Brien's disillusionment was understandable. As a social club of amateur ball players like the Eckfords, the Atlantics had experienced far greater success in the early days of organized baseball. They were recognized as national champions seven times by 1867. But professionalism was intruding so strongly that by the mid-1870s, the Atlantics and the Eckfords alike had given up baseball entirely and reverted to being social clubs. As the earlier years faded into memory, many participants followed Pete O'Brien's lead in expressing dismay that baseball would never again be the same. In some ways, they were right. The sense of belonging that was conveyed by club membership would never again be as central to the ball playing experience. And no genuinely amateur club would ever again seriously compete for supremacy against the best professional teams. Yet hindsight also made it possible to see the game in a new light raising doubts about whether it really was a golden age after all. The clubs that some men remembered with great fondness brought back memories for others of the most aristocratic English social clubs and their exclusionary practices. As for the failed ban on professionalism, the most outspoken defender of the rule was Frank Pigeon, the former pitcher and star of the Eckford Club. While some advocated a middle ground in which players could be compensated for lost wages and travel expenses while still being considered amateurs, Pigeon led the hardliners in arguing that a man who does not pay his obligations and has in his power to do so is a knave and not fit to be trusted in a game of ball or anything else. And if he has not the money, his time would be better spent in earning the same than playing ball. Business first, pleasure afterwards. Comments such as those make it easy to understand why the advent of professional play led Pigeon and the Eckford Club to join Pete O'Brien's Atlantic Club and many other stalwarts of baseball's amateur era in giving up baseball and returning to their essence as social clubs. There is a notable irony about Pigeon's position, however. At a lavish dinner thrown in 1851 to celebrate the victory of the yacht America, Pigeon's close friend George Steers was not invited, despite having designed the yacht. Why? Steers was not considered a social equal of the yachting crowd. As the treatment of George Steers suggests, while the issue of amateurism in sports is often thought of as a question of purity, it was never that simple. The same doors that admitted some into membership were often used to keep others out. Similarly, while these troublesome issues robbed some of their love of the game, many were able to see past them. Long after the end of the amateur era, the baseball diamond continued to provide reminders of the sheer joy of playing the game. As professionalism crept into the game, the muffin players who had been consigned to the benches and clubhouses during the early 1860s began to step into center stage by playing riotously funny muffin games. 
The quality of play was laughably bad, but enormous crowds turned out to watch muffin games, both for the belly laughs they elicited and because they demonstrated that joy, not money, was still the essence of the game. Muffin play was even celebrated in a rare book from 1867 titled Baseball as Viewed by a Muffin, which featured many humorous cartoons about the game, again embracing the lighter side of baseball. Rivalries between neighboring villages also continued despite the occasional revolver, and these contests created as much passion as ever. One side won, and the joy of their victory was shared by an entire community. As for the other side, they didn't lose. They simply resolved to wait until next year. New rivalries also emerged between competing college, high school, and industrial teams, few of whose players made a dime from the game. Most important of all, children played the game. The poet Carl Sandburg spoke for millions of Americans when he wrote of his own childhood contests in Galesburg, Illinois, during the 1880s and 90s. On many a summer day, I played baseball starting at 8 in the morning, running home at noon for a quick meal, and again with fielding and batting till it was too dark to see the ball. There were times my head seemed empty of everything but baseball names and figures, and I had my opinions about who was better than anybody else in the national game. For children, there was always the promise of next year. Precisely because each generation of Americans has thought of their childhood years as baseball's golden age, that era has never died. Give me one second here and I will be right back on board with you all to get everything set up for doing the other things I got to do. But this is Donald Blomdahl, Hall of Fame veteran, sports cards and collectibles coming to you live. This is how I do my, my Thursday lessons. I'll start off with the lesson. I'll be in the live chat with everybody. And then afterwards, we will get into the content at hand. So let me just uh, get my camera lined up on my brake mat here. Just so you all know what's going on. Let me zoom out a little bit here and get lined up. First order of business here is I will get started with um, everything we got going on there. Get up to the live chat here. I want to thank uh, John Fishman for his $2 Super Chat. I did ring the bell when your Super Chat came up earlier there, John. Maybe you didn't hear it, but I did ring the bell. It was a little bit after you did the Super Chat. I was thinking, okay, yeah, I'll ring the bell when, when I get a Super Chat in. And then just toward the end of our lesson there, my wife gave me a year number one in her books. <laughs> I'm her, uh, she's my number one fan, I think. But I don't know. There's others that would probably challenge her. But... In my book, my wife is my one number one fan, that's for sure. And she does listen to a lot of my Bible reading content when she gets a chance. And she is probably off to work again. But that is what we're doing. Wheeling and dealing gas at work. There we go. All right, John. Sounds like a winner. But let me get, uh, I got to get John Fishman in here. I got Elliot Brakes. Elliot Brakes and John Fishman came in right at the why first to chat in the live stream and then the uh of course john not only gets his first in the in the live chat but he gets his two entries for his two dollar super chat and my wife gets five entries for her five dollar super emoji that she gave so there we go um that's okay that's why i just ran it again so you could hear it you might have stepped away at the time when it, I rang the bell, but that's okay. So real quick, I'm going to get John Fishman, his three entries into the soup, into the giveaway for the month of uh, September. 
So let me get John in here. There's one. There's two. There's three. Let me get Elliot in here. E L L I O T T. Elliot Briggs. P R E A K S. All right. And then let me get my wife in for her five entries. Again, the disclaimer with my wife is that uh, she. If she if her name is chosen, she has opted to not take the the prize for the, for that monthly giveaway. She just likes popping in and showing her support on my channel once in a while. Uh, three. Right, got all those names in there. Let me go ahead and save this content and then we will get into our family mail call package for today. This one kind of surprised me and caught me off guard. I wasn't expecting one from um, Steve Griffith, but I did get a family mail call package when I went to my business address yesterday. So I don't have any clue or any idea what's in there. She probably wants less cards in the house, huh? How many do you think you have? Uh, <laughs> oh, easily, I would say easily three or four hundred thousand cards. Yes, um, that's 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 the whole deal. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to to sell as many as I can. That's for sure. Oh, I thought Steve Griffith was the guy in the video. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry about that. <laughs> that was cute. I wasn't even paying attention to that. No, Steve Griffith is who I got this family mail call package from. Steve Griffith is who I got the family mail call package from here. So that's... <laughs> I'm trying to remember the guy that does the videos for... Um, for the series I'm using. Um, they do allow it to be shared on social media and stuff. So I think YouTube is kind of like a social media type platform. So that's why I'm sharing it there. I haven't, uh, YouTube hasn't indicated that I cannot use that material. Um, when I used my video clips the other day, um, I did, didn't get a, uh, a copyright strike but they just informed me that I can use the video clips from MLB. It's just the, the, the people that own the rights to the MLB videos, they're the ones that will get monetized for it. And I understand that. I understand that. But because I tied it in with a, a uh, biography lesson with the player that I was highlighting in the videos, that's why they allowed me to have that content in there. I was wondering how that worked. Did not know for sure. But now I have a better picture, so that down the road in the future, I might throw some video clips from MLB. Um, I do uh, did, was able to uh, graciously have somebody on my channel that gifted me a subscription to uh, MLB TV. So I will use that uh, for sure when I have the opportunity to use some video clips, maybe on my uh, player biographies and things like that. Boom! Left Behind Times just gave me a four ninety nine super chat. Super chat. Hello, sir. Wanted to stop by to say hello before I head off to work. God bless. Thank you, there, Left Behind. Really do appreciate that. Let me get Left Behind Times into uh, my. September giveaway. Let me uh, add these in real quick here. There we go. Oh, where'd it go? All right, I got five entries in there for Left Behind. Let me save this for the September drawing. My names are growing exponentially here. Just give you a, a, a look at the wheel here. You can see all those little slivers in the wheel. 
you might be able to see your names in there when I do my drawing uh, next Wednesday. Next Wednesday's live stream will be the last day of the month for September. So um, at the end of the stream next Wednesday, which would be in right about in the afternoon, the way we've been going on our Tops baseball card set live streams, um, that's when we will have the drawing for the September giveaway. I actually already have the October giveaway ready to go also. I'm kind of trying to plan ahead. So pretty much what I got to get ready next is uh, my November and December giveaways. Of course, Christmas is going to be the end of the year big extravaganza. I'm debating on whether we might have a first, second, and third place prize for that month. But most likely, I would think we probably will. But that'll be forthcoming and forth announced when we get that to that point. So let me uh, get back into the live stream here. So we are going to... Oh, I, did anybody notice anything slightly different on my break table today? For those that might be in the live stream here. Anybody notice anything on the break table that was not there earlier this week? I know if it was a snake, it would bite you. But just kind of curious if anybody is paying attention or if anybody uh, notices. I'll give you a few seconds to see if you want to respond. It does say that we do have three people watching. Let me see who it shows for participants. Looks like maybe he left behind. I don't know if he's still here. John Fishman and me. So probably not too many people in here. But that's okay. How about if I if I tip this a little bit? There we go. You can probably see it now. Got in a new little sampling product. Anytime a, a sticker mule gives me a bonus or something cheaper to just try. I did get 50 of these little little stickers here. These little holographic stickers. I like that though. That is pretty awesome. I always like the, the baseball holographic type cards they have and stuff. So there is my holographic uh, sticker. Looks like refractor stickers, Blomdahl logo. Very nice. There we go. So those might be coming to a package near you when you get something in the mail from me. I'll kind of leave that hang out in the background there, right in front of uh, Mike Myers' autograph card there. So, the stickers look great. Criterium Brace are still here. Kyle Lewis is going, is going to get Rookie of the Year. I think he's got a pretty good chance. I'm pretty sure he's got a pretty good chance there. But without further ado, I am excited. I got this yesterday when I checked my business address. And I am going to see what Steve has sent me here. It always threw me off. I'm thinking Herbert Griffith on the stickers. And that must be uh, where he lives in, in uh, the Pensacola area, I think. Must be just the sticker that he uses there. But I'm going to go ahead and open this up. I don't have any idea what he has sent me. Um, but we are going to open this up here um, and see what... Steve has sent me. Okay. So let's see what we got here. I think I can open this up so I can reuse this bag again for a future mailing for somebody else. Uh, sorry about that. I forgot to turn the volume back down. So I don't get the feedback. That's okay. It just reminds me to do it when I hear myself talking in the background. <laughs> mm, looks just looks like some cards. I know the last time he sent me, he sent me a bunch of cards and stuff, and just told me I could share things, whatever I don't PC with others in the channel. But it could be he's just sending me some more Seattle Mariners. I got to one of these days get him. Oh, sorry. Uh, do have the bag empty there. Nothing left inside. Just so you do know. <laughs> Let me set that bag off to the side here. And uh, 
Let's see who we got here. It looks like it might be some team bags of the Seattle Mariners. Different years, different products. We will see what we have here. Could be some more Seattle Mariners for my Seattle Mariners collection. Don Fishman, I need to send you some cards, Donald. No problem. <laughs> Anytime you want to, John. Uh, my address is in my About Me tab. Um, so that's not a problem whatsoever. Um, anybody can send me a family mail call package. If you want to put a note in there, if it's your first time sending something to me, that is fine too. And we can we can go into making trades, uh, things of that nature, um, on a family mail call package. Um, but yeah, that would be cool. Um, so we got Nelson Cruz here with the Seattle Mariners. There's Edwin Diaz. We had him for one short, well, part of the 2000, the end of the 2018 season. Then he, he became our closer last year in 2019. Or no, actually 2018. 17 and 18, 19. Last year they traded him away. He went to New York, I believe. Um, did you see postal workers are refusing to do some areas of Chicago? Because a couple carriers have gotten shot. Uh, that does not surprise me. I mean, they tell us to protect the mail. But if it means getting shot or whatnot, we would. Uh, we are told to just leave the mail. And uh, if, like, if they've, they've had instances where the mail trucks have caught fire and stuff. Um, they say, just get out of the vehicle. Your life is more important than somebody's letters and packages inside the mail. Things like that can be replaced, but it's hard to replace a person if they are shot or burned up in their mail truck. So just some food for thought on that one, because I did work, work for the post office for 20 years. And the closest I got, the postal union is telling residents they will have to go pick up their mail. Oh, yeah, if you can't uh, deliver any mail, they... They can always tell the residents they, they have to come to their local post office to pick up their mail. And that has happened numerous times, that's for sure. So we got Edwin Diaz here with the Topps Chrome. There we go, Dave Fleming with the Seattle Mariners. This is, I believe, uh, 1992 Topps. 1992 Topps, Bill Kruger with the... I'm not going to say Seattle Mariners every card here because I think these are probably all Seattle Mariners in case you're wondering they're left behind. So I'll just go through and highlight who the Mariners cards are in this in this run here. Russ Swan with the Mariners. There we go. Jay Bruce, Topps Heritage. That's a newer one, I believe. Uh, 2019 Topps Heritage. Dave Fleming with the Mariners, Gold Cup card. Russ Swan. Russ Swan with the Seattle Mariners. Mariners leaders. There we go. Young. They might say on the back. I don't. They don't really say who's in the picture per se, but interesting nonetheless. There we go. There's our first Hall of Famer, uh, Randy Johnson. Randy Johnson from um, a 1992 tops. 1992 tops. I'm pretty sure that's our only. Of course, Nelson Cruz could make it in. We don't know for sure. Dave Fleming, Gold Cup, Jay Bruce, Swan. I think that's the only Hall of Famer we got so far out of here. Spike Owen with a uh, uh, 1985 tops. Um, you say Kikuchi. You say Kikuchi. I say Kikuchi. 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 Oh, man, then let me do one big Seattle Mariners. No, I'll do it once in a while, but I'm not going to do it every card. When every card's a Seattle Mariner, I'd be here all day long trying to shout out the Seattle Mariners. But these are all Seattle Mariners. Awesome, awesome, awesomeness. Dave Fleming with the Seattle Mariners. Mike Jackson. That is a 1991 Leaf product. Here's in some opening day cards here, I think. Some opening days. Um, Marco Gonzalez. He's our up-and-coming pitcher to be one of the replacements for King Felix. D. Gordon. Um, he's changed his name this year and added on to it. And I think he's got it. Uh, but it's D. Strange Gordon. 
the strange or strange d gordon strange d gordon it's one of the, i can't remember the exact way they've got it you say kikuchi opening day kyle lewis there we go that kyle lewis will go separate into my kyle lewis uh collection here i will throw that one in with my uh kyle lewis uh so collection for his rookie cards i've got a little and hopefully it'll go up in value here with uh up and coming things here but domingo santana with the seattle learners and kyle seager kyle seager he has a chance to i think get into possibly the hall of fame we'll see down the road he's still got a whole bunch of years i think left in him though so there's our first team bag there let's move into team bag number two here team bag number two here for i think some more seattle mariners all right as left behind likes to say he likes when i say my seattle mariners <laughs> there we go tom murphy uh for the seattle mariners uh mitch hanniger just tur look on the back here see if we got any uh jip uh short prints uh you say kakuchi boom there we go kyle lewis another kyle lewis kyle lewis alert Kyle Lewis alert. That's the first one. That's the second one. Kyle Lewis alert. Got the Kyle Lewis alert going here. I put all my Kyle Lewis's in top loaders and set them in my Kyle Lewis separation box. But another Kyle Lewis rookie card there. Put that one up there. Justin Dunn, rated rookie. Omar Narvaez. With the Seattle Mariners, Domingo Santana, Daniel Vogel back. Good old Dan. Sent them back down to the minor lakes. Mitch Hanniger. He's no longer with us. But Mitch Hanniger, when he was, boom, Ken Griffey Jr. Ken Griffey Jr. Why did he put it? Got it in a little bit bigger. I like to use those ones for my uh, relic cards. So let's get this Ken Griffey Jr. in a penny sleeve. And Ken Griffey Jr. gets a... He gets a bell ringer there. Ken Griffey Jr., my favorite PC player. Ken Griffey Jr. All right, now we got a Justice Sheffield. I do have a... For prior up-and-coming rookies there, but Justice Sheffield. Justice Sheffield. Got to put him up here. I do have a, a Justice Sheffield rookie card collection and a Yusei Kikuchi rookie card collection. Brett Boone. Brett Boone for FLIR product. What year is this FLIR? Uh, 2002. 2002. And then a Jamie Moyer. Jamie Moyer. Kazuhiro Suzaki. Kazuhiro Suzaki. Then we've got uh, Alex Colome. D. Strange Gordon again with the Seattle Mariners. Wade LeBlanc. Uh, Seattle Mariners uh, stadium card. Safe Go Field. Established 1999, but now it is called T-Mobile Park. T-Mobile Park got the naming rights. I think they got a longer contract. I think it's 30 years, if I remember. Pretty good contract there. Sam T T Viala with the Mariners and Mike Zanino, Mike Z. Okay, moving on to team bag number three here. Team bag number three for the Seattle Mariners. All right, so we'll see. I will do these for sure, but we'll see if we go any further with this. Um, I do have a lot of things going on when my wife gets off this afternoon. We got to go and clean our church. The ladies are doing an event on Friday and Saturday. Um, Saturday, I don't know for sure. I might do a pre recorded stream that will load up at 10 30. I'm going to a, uh, a uh, political luncheon, a political luncheon with my pastor and one of the other men in the church to another church farther south from us. 
And we're going to listen to somebody that is running for governor in our state that we want to try and get him elected. So that's going to preempt my regularly scheduled live stream for this Saturday. But we're fine because next Saturday I'll be open back up again. And that will be... Oh man, then let me do... Okay, boom, 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 boom. I thought that was a new one. I'm just reading the same thing over again. Let me do a refresh real quick here so I know I got those. My chat is up to date. Separation of church and state. Exactly. Don't worry about that, John. Everything is cool and everything is fine. What we do in our free time when it's not a church service is separate. <laughs> so the Seattle Mariners, Franklin Gutierrez... Uh, Casey Kochman, Jose Lupe, Lopez, we got Jack Wilson, uh, here's a rookie card for Kenkoa Tech area. Then we got David Vallier, David, he's actually a, one of our announcers for the Seattle Mariners, this is his 1990 Flair card. Brian Holman, Mariners pitcher from 1991. All right, Ben to court. Yuniski bent the court. Seattle Mariners shortstop back in the day. This was 2007. And then uh, Richie Sexton, or Sexton, uh, Seattle Mariners first baseman. Boom! Ken Griffey Jr. once again. Ken Griffey Jr. once again. Boom, boom, boom. There we go. Uh, Carl Everett, designated hitter. Flair, this what what year is he, are these flares? 2006. 2006. Jeremy Reed, outfielder. Um, Felix Hernandez with the Seattle Mariners. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Juan Baniquez with the Seattle Mariners. This is an older card. Um, 1980. 1981 uh, Tops card, and this is Tops, right? Dun, dun, dun. Late Flare, that's a Flare product. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. That's a Flare. Then we got Adrian Beltre. When Adrian Beltre was with the Seattle Mariners, 2005 Classic Clippings. And then also Richie Saxon. Again, Classic Clippings, 2005. Five. Yep. And then we've got Ultra Stars, Randy Johnson. There we go. Another another Hall of Famer here, Randy Johnson. Along with Mike Ken Griffey Juniors. Alright. And then Russ Swanson with the Seattle Mariners. 93 Flair. Boom. Uh rookie card. That's for uh Greg Hallman. 2011, uh, Alan and Ginter, and then last but not least, another Daniel Vogelback, first baseman for the Seattle Mariners and designated hitter. He's been up and down. First came into the majors back in 2016 with Seattle, and then went back to Tacoma, Pacific Coast League. Then 17, he was in the American League. They they did come up earlier this year, but he he's he's like on a on a roller coaster right now. He does good, and then I think he loses all his uh his flow's just not there. Let's say um, he'll do really good when he starts the season, and then he'll just kind of slack off, and I think go on the wayside. Either that, or he just runs out of energy. He's got to work on his. Uh, his weight's not super, super bad, but he does got to trim down just a little bit and get a little bit more beefy, not just doing all the working out to try and just hit them home runs. You can't be a good ball player just hitting home runs. You have to be able to all, be an all-around good ball player to keep to make it to the majors and stay in the majors. So they're keeping their eye on Dan, Dan Vogelback. He's... Um, Let's see, I'm trying to think. He was born in 92, so he's he's coming up on 30 years old, so he's got to get things going. Uh, he needs to trim some weight. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. That's what I think will definitely help him for sure. But appreciate you sending me these cards there. 
Steve. Really do appreciate that. Hopefully he's watching the stream. Um, but we did get a couple of Hall of Famers, two Randy Johnson cards, go into my Hall of Fame separation. We got Ken Griffey Jr. We got two Kyle Lewis's. We got a Justice Sheffield rookie card. So that is totally awesome there. And without further ado, um, I think I still have time. I'm going to do a little bit of a cleanup here and we will open up a bonus blaster box. That'll leave me two more in my blaster box content. So let me just set these all off to the side here. Um, I know where all these Seattle Mariners go. They go into my Seattle Mariners holdout. So I'll just set them off to the side here. The Randy Johnsons will go into my Hall of Fame separation for uh, those guys. So let me put the Randy Johnsons in my Hall of Fame holdout here. My Ken Griffey Juniors will go in my Ken Griffey Junior boxes for the separation process. And I will put my Kyle Lewis's and file them away later. And I will put this Justice Sheffield in a top loader and put this in with my Justice Sheffield rookie card collection. All right. That is, I like the, I like anytime it's a shiny card. I like shiny cards. That's card number 47. So that'll go in my Justice Sheffield separation here. And without further ado, let me get my, my, all right, get my little uh, card holders here as we go through this blaster box. Let me get stand number three up here, stand number four, and we'll break out a blaster box and go through this. I think we can do it in about a half an hour. We need to finish up pretty close to about noon time here today. I'm going to send you. Da -da -da cards next week once I get into town to get bubble mailers. No problem there, John. All right, so let's go ahead and go into this one right here. Gonna open up this blaster box here. Gonna open up this 2020 blaster box in my search to try to complete the base set. I think I got less than 50 cards to go in the 325 card set. At least Ethan did send me a couple cards I needed for my to complete my set. Especially he sent that one short print card that I opened up earlier in the fan mail packages this week. I think it was yesterday if I remember right. But let's go ahead and uh, get this here, score this box, and get rolling with this box break. Get that scored right there so the plastic will rip right off. Go ahead and set this back up here. Let me move my Ichiro back out from that little hiding place I had him in. All right. Let me go ahead and take off the plastic on this box and get this one ready to rock and roll here. With these seven packs. All right, so there's our box loader, our box top loader, our one exclusive 1964 Tops giant card inside. Giant card, okay. And let's get our seven packs out so we can go through these. Let me put our box in the back room here. Get it all set up. Put it in usual fashion here for preparing. To do this one, let me set that right there. Put this guy right there. Can have Kevin watch out for us there. Let's see, I think I've got, let's see, I can do this one over a little bit more. This one here, that one up here, and this one like that. There we go. And then, we can lay these guys out right here. I gotta fix my brake mat here. And get that repaired a little bit. All right. 
put our seven packs out here so we can start going through these as we go through each and in, in the order out of the box from one through seven all right sports line hello donald hope you are doing well yes we are we just had our lesson this morning uh, lesson number three, the era of amateur baseball clubs. Then we did our family mail call uh, package from uh, Steve Griffith. I need to get me a sip of water. And now we are going to open up this blaster box from 2020 Tops Archives Baseball. Trying to complete the set. All right, so I I just noticed that in the little corner of the box. I never read. It says MLB stars in classic tops designs. All right, so let's keep on rolling through here and see who we can find in our quest to complete the set. Again, after I finish these three boxes here, I'll put my list up on which cards I'm searching for to complete this set. I'm just looking for the base cards and the. The, the high number short prints but we will go from there so we got Jordan Yamamoto with the Miami Marlins alright that is our first low number the low number rookie card Xander Bogarts with the Boston Red Sox Xander Bogarts and then next here we've got our Toronto Blue Jays Roberto Alomar Roberto Alomar for our middle numbers, our 100s. This is up to 100. This is 101 to 200. And then this will be uh, 201 to 300. And then this will be the high numbers or the insert cards. That's how we kind of lay these out here. Sandy Koufax with the Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher. Kerry Wood, Chicago Cubs pitcher, Kerry Wood. All right, and then we've got Baby Blue Jays, Bichette and Guerrero. I've got that one already. It's nice to get another one of those. All right, Alan Trammell with the Detroit Tigers for our 2002. And Whitey Ford. Whitey Ford with the New York Yankees. You can see, this is the... 2002 series so again the different series that we do have here that these cards are on is the 1955 tops design the 1974 tops design and then the 2002 tops design and then miscellaneous different uh, variations of archives years for the inserts and the uh, short print cards so whitey ford there for the new york yankees rounds out our first pack in the archives box so far and all these blaster boxes that I've opened up for 2020 tops archives I've only found one short print card one short print card I found some serialized ones some variation ones but one short print and uh, when I'm done opening up the product I'll show you the variations that the, the, the normal one and the short print version when we do that, moving on to pack number two. Pack number two in our box, Ozzy Albies. Ozzy Albies with the Atlanta Braves. Then we've got next, we've got Max Muncie here with the Los Angeles Dodgers. Next up to bat here, we got Roberto Clemente with the Pittsburgh Pirates. That was Roberto Alomar, that's right. <laughs> I was thinking, didn't we have that one? Not quite. Robert or Roberto Clemente with the Pirates. Then we've got Trent Grisham, San Diego Padres rookie card. And boom! I can't remember if I got Marco yet. Marco Gonzalez with the Seattle Mariners. There he goes. Marco Gonzalez with the Seattle Mariners. All right. Sorry, Marco, you got to go in the back. Got to leave the Hall of Famers in the front. All right, and then we've got, um, this is Zach Collins. All right, with the Chicago White Sox rookie card. And our 1955 throwback 
style card. This style is a 1960 card on that Bobachet. Bobachet Grow, in case you're wondering. Boom! Frank Thomas the Hurt Hall of Famer for the Chicago White Sox. And Alex Rodriguez with the Texas Rangers. For our throwback card there. Not quite the Hall of Fame yet. We'll be on to pack number three. In this seven pack. Blaster box of Tops Archives. All right. Boom. There we go. Malik Smith with the Seattle Mariners. Outfielder. Then next we got here, we've got Nick Senzel with the Cincinnati Reds. And Matt Carpenter with the St. Louis Cardinals. Right next up to bat, we got here Cattell Marte with the Arizona Diamondbacks, second baseman and outfielder for Kevin's car collecting and more there. And boom, back to back cards for Kevin. San Diego Padres first baseman, Eric Hosmer. Eric Hosmer? Boom! Unfortunately, I got this short print card, but now I got more than one. Hammer and Hank Aaron. I think I got a couple of these. So some of these might come to a sale near you next Saturday. But Hank Aaron with the Milwaukee Brewers, short print card number 311. All right, then we got Andres Munoz. Andres Munoz, uh, San Diego Padres, rookie card for Andres Munoz. And John Means, Gold Cup card for the Baltimore Orioles. All right. Moving on to pack number four, the middle of the box, as we continue on here. All right. So here we go. J.D. Martinez, a designated hitter and outfielder for the Boston Red Sox. Jake Fraley with the Seattle Mariners outfielder. I'm right in front here for now. Dylan Cease, rookie card for the Chicago White Sox. Next we got here, the 1974 throwback cards. Kansas City Royals, third baseman and outfielder, Hunter Dozier. Hunter Dozier. Next up to bat, we got the Chicago Cubs pitcher, John Lester. John Lester. And next we got up the bat, New York Yankees second baseman, D.J. LeMayhew. D.J. LeMayhew. Then we've got uh, the Atlanta Braves, Andrew Jones. Andrew Jones for the 2002 tops. And uh, Pedro Martinez for the Boston Red Sox. Pretty sure he's a Hall of Famer. Pedro Martinez. Moving on to pack number five. Slide these down a little bit here. Keep rolling through. Thummies up, thummies up. Don't forget a thummies up for me here. All right. See a Hall of Famer on the back here. Tim Ling Link Lincecum with the San Francisco Giants. Al Kaline Hall of Famer. That's our first Hall of Famer in the 1955 throwbacks. Al Kaline with the Detroit Tigers. George Kell. George Kell with the Detroit Tigers. Back to back Detroit Tigers there. All right. And then next we got up to bat uh, Abraham Toro rookie card for the Houston Astros. Next we got up to bat New York Mets pitcher. Jacob de Grom. Jacob de Grom. And then Gliber Torres, selected by the Youth of America. Gliber Torres, New York Yankees tops, all star rookie short stop and second baseman, gold cup guard. All right, put you right behind Hammer and Hank Aaron there. And then boom, Ichiro. Ichiro. Uh, he's not a Hall of Famer yet, but I put him in the front because he is a future Hall of Famer for sure. In 2025, will be first. He'll be picked, elected into the Hall of Fame in 2025. 
and Juan Maracal with the San Francisco Giants. All right, Hall of Famer Juan Maracal. All right, next up to bat, pack number six in our quest for short prints and variation cards. I will verify in case. I mean, unless somebody happens to notice that I pull a variation if you're familiar with the set more than me. Um, there we go. Hall of Famer Gary Carter with the New York Mets catcher. Next we have Michael Brantley. Houston Astros outfielder. Then we've got next up to bat Duke Snyder with the Brooklyn Dodgers outfielder. Duke Snyder. Then we got Sammy Sosa. Sammy Sosa with the Chicago Cubs. We got David Ortiz, designated hitter with the Boston Red Sox. Boom. There we go. That's a short print card. Number 318. Randy Johnson, Hall of Famer with the Seattle Mariners. May 25th, 1989, Seattle lands Lofty Lefty. I like that. Lofty Lefty. And then Chris Bryant with the Chicago Cubs. And Austin Meadows with the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. Tampa Bay Rays. Boom. Okay, moving on to pack number seven, our final. And then we will do the box topper. See who we get in that one. Doing good for time here. Rolling right along. All right, Lucas Giolito for the Chicago White Sox. Lucas Giolito. And then next we got up to bat here, Gary Sanchez with the New York Yankees. Shun Yamaguchi with the Toronto Blue Jays pitcher rookie card. Eloy Eminez, Chicago White Sox outfielder. And Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher Walker Bueller. Next we have up to that up to bat is um H is for Homers, Hoskins and Harmer Har Har Harmer ha, ha, Hoskins and Harper <laughs> Tongue Twister with the H's Andral Andralton Simmons with the California Angels and Michael Chavez with the Boston Red Sox. So nothing earth shattering here except for the the Hammer and Hank Aaron. The Hammer and Hank Aaron. I don't know for sure if I got the Randy Johnson short print. But that is kind of cool. And then the short print here, the I don't know if I have the Randy Johnson or not. I'll find out when I check my checklist. Alright. Moving on to do our slow reveal and reading the information on the back of the top box topper. We will get ready to go to town here with this and see who we get. See if I get a different one or if it's a duplicate of some of the box toppers I have already. Okay. Don't know for sure who it is. Oh, I think I have an ideal. All right. Let's do our slow reveal here as I pull up the card for this player. I only saw the ball cap. I think it's a Cleveland. I think it's a, I'm pretty sure that's a Cleveland. Cleveland Indians, probably. Let's see, who do we have here? Anybody recognize those eyes? It's like the day of the mask, so you have to try and see that. David Pert, how you doing there, David Pert? Thanks for popping into the stream here. Any ideals? Who do we got there? Who do we got there? Pretty sure it's a Cleveland Indians. Yep, it is a Cleveland Indians pitcher. Or, not pitcher. Francisco Lindor. Francisco Lindor is our box topper here. 
And we got Saved by the Slam. Saved by the Slam. The Yankees look poised to even the 2017 ALDS at a game apiece before Francisco Lindor provided the crucial spark in game two. Cleveland entered in the bottom of the sixth inning, trailing eight to three, but then loaded the bases with two outs for their sensational shortstop. Zeroing in on a 1-0 breaking ball, Francisco uncoiled and hit a soaring drive that clanged off the right field foul pole. The grand slam sent progressive field into delirium and cut the New York lead to 8-7. The Indians went on to tie the game in the 8th inning and then win it 9-8 in the 13th. Lindor's blast Key's improbable rally. There we go. So that is pretty, pretty awesome there. Francisco Lindor. I don't think I've got this one already. But if I do, I'll have one for our sale next week. <laughs> I'll have one for our sale next week. But there we go. Hopefully everybody enjoyed um, this here. Let me turn that over just a hair here. Um, left behind. I'm still here. Got you going on in the car on the way to work. Hope all hope all has a good rest of the day. You too there, left behind. You take care. Um, and uh, by the way, just so you do know, I watched all of your 70 videos. Gave you view time for that for your whole watch list. Um, I, I'm gonna go back and watch some of them when I have time when I'm doing sortings sortings and stuff. But I just wanted to say I did watch all of your videos. So I'm up to date on your channel uh, as far as giving you the view time. Okay. And I will um, go back and watch some of the pertinent ones that I think seem uh, pretty interesting. I caught bits and clips of certain different ones. Uh, I pulled the Mike Trout Stadium Club short print yesterday. Oh, that's cool there, David. All right. But I'm going to go ahead and turn the camera around, do my signature goodbye. I was hoping I could be done by noon, and it looks like we are going to do that. So tomorrow, just give you a real quick heads up, since I do have a couple of minutes here. We are going to do tomorrow will be the next round in our Hall of Fame Fridays, and it will be the 1945 Hall of Famers. We will be doing the 1945 Hall of Famers next week and let me just give you an idea of who our 1945 hall of famers are okay i'll just go down the list so you have a heads up we're gonna have 10 hall of famers tomorrow in our list for hall of fame friday we will have roger Bresh breshnahan uh dan brothers yeah, uh, Roger Breshnahan, uh, New York Giants catcher. Dan Brothers, uh, Buffalo Bisons first baseman. Um, Fred Clark, Pittsburgh Pirates left fielder. Jimmy Collins, Collins, Jimmy Collins, Boston Red Sox third baseman. Um, Ed Delahanty, um, Philadelphia Phillies left fielder. Um, Hugh Duffy. Boston Braves outfielder, um, Hughie Jennings, Baltimore Orioles shortstop, um, King Kelly, Chicago White Stockings right fielder, and then Jim O'Rourke, New York Giants left fielder, and Wilbert Robinson, uh, Brooklyn Dodgers manager. Okay, those will be our 10 Hall of Famers will be done for our Hall of Fame Friday tomorrow. And other than that, um, Kevin's car collecting and more. I've been lurking while at work. Have a great day. Oh, no problem, Kevin. I figured you might be in the background lurking. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera around here real quick. Say my signature goodbye. I am wearing a little bit different gear today. I'm wearing green along with our, I could have wore our, I sh that's what I should have wore. My wife went and took, borrowed my daughter's um, uh, Russell Wilson jersey, 
for something they had going on at work today. So that's why I went with a Seattle Seahawks theme today. A Seattle Seahawks theme. Although you'll see my t-shirt is not a Seattle Seahawks shirt. So I mixed my football with my baseball. Just so you do know. But, um, so, yes, this is the Seattle Mariners. Um, my, part of my Seattle Mariners gear, I do have a Seattle Mariners. I got a Russell Wilson jersey that I wear also. A lot of times me and our, my daughter would wear our, our Seattle Seahawks jerseys on Sunday afternoons when we watch the games downstairs. But, um, so, yeah. So, just wanted to wear this hat today for our Seattle Seahawks who are 2-0. and 2-0. and all right, I'm not really following football this year. I'm just giving you the updates and the stats on it. But so far, two games in the books, and we're undefeated so far. But I don't like some of the stuff they're doing in football, so I'm not saying I don't totally not support them, but I don't support what they're doing. Uh, sports and politics need to be separate. They need to be separate, in my ideal. Boo, the 12th man stinks. Quarantine Dragon Fan Tim. Oh man, Dragon Quarantine Dragon Fan Tim, you 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 snuck up on me there. Boo, the twelfth man stinks. <laughs> All right, I'll admit it. Yeah, I'm a twelfth man, and as soon as after this Sunday, probably Monday morning, I'm gonna put up my twelfth man flag outside my house, cause that's about the only way I'll support my team is just put the twelfth man flag out. Sorry, Dragon fan. Don't hold that against me, okay? <laughs> I just kind of encourage my daughter. She she don't like baseball like me. She likes football, and she does fantasy league football and all that stuff. So, uh, But I'm not a big super football fan. I'm pretty much uh, probably 99.5% baseball. <laughs> so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get ready to wrap things up. Just wanted to do that and show you I'm wearing my Rated Wookie t-shirt. I'm wearing my green Rated Rookie t-shirt. For those that know what shirt I was probably wearing, I'm wearing my Rated Rookie t-shirt and my Seattle Seahawks ball cap. All right. And this has been Donald Blonda Hall of Fame Veteran Sports Cards and Collectibles. Um, having been live to you from Arlington, Washington, hope you all are having a wonderful Thursday, and we will see you tomorrow for my Hall of Fame Fridays starting at 1030 sharp. Okay, y'all take care and have a wonderful and blessed day. Bye for now. I'll leave you on that screenshot there, and don't forget if you haven't done it, thummies up, thummies up thummies up for me and uh, you could be a Lions fan like me we haven't won since 1957 <laughs> that means you haven't been you the Detroit Lions haven't won since uh, since I was born I was born in 1958 there Dragon Fan Tim so uh, I guess I guess you need to uh, oh thanks there David Pert <laughs> cool shirt <laughs> all right so you all take care. It is 11.59. I wanted to sign off by 12 o'clock. We will see you all tomorrow for Hall of Fame Friday stream at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Take care and Lord bless you all. Okay, bye for now.